a blessing to be able to sing with Danny and to uh, minister with him and to serve the Lord with him and Liz as, as he's my brother and she's my sister-in-law. Uh, but uh, I really look forward to uh, singing with him when we sing our from time to time. So we've been doing it regularly for uh, in recent months. Uh, songs that I wanted to hear us sing, and sings the songs that I wanted to sing to the Lord. Uh, several weeks ago, I'll say this, uh, there's the person who was Danny's choral teacher in high school, for, all through high school, uh, chimed in on one of our songs, I have to let, leave a little note there telling us that she enjoyed the song. So, it was a little bit unnerving to know that she's even listening to us sing. So, if she heard that, I'm sure that she enjoyed that. But it's a, she is, uh, they, they even made a, a couple of records, recordings. They were a great choral group in his junior and senior year especially. They toured, did concert chorus. And uh, she's been a friend of our family for very long time. She grew up in Terry's neighborhood there. Her father was a pastor there at Pleasant Valley Baptist Church called the Leon Dawson. So uh, I guess it's best just to sing as if nobody's listening and pretend that's so. But there are lots of people listening out there. Lots of people tune in. If you ever have anything to say, a song to sing, a testimony to give, there are many people who could benefit from hearing that not only here in our congregation in our church, but also people who are tuning in. There are people now that I know, that I have met, I've become acquainted with, and become friends with now that I never even knew before. Once I began, they were wanting some place to worship. There are members of our family, two members of Terry's family, my family, who, who tune in, who listen, so that, uh, they can hear an encouraging word during this time. Something a little unusual this morning. Let's look together in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And that chapter is about resurrection. We've already kind of introduced it with, a, with talking about what the gospel is. Paul says the gospel is four things. has four steps to it. Four parts. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again as the scriptures promised. And he was seen. He says that's the gospel. That's what contains the power of God and the salvation. I want to talk with you today about the resurrection hope. Because that is a part of what is a part of our faith regardless of what uh, now, the best thing that a, a Hindu or a Buddhist can offer is reincarnation. In other words, another chance in that sense of coming back in a different life. But the Bible teaches us that the life that God started here on earth is one of a kind. And it's not repeatable, but it is and it can and it will be eternal. The human spirit that indwells us, the Bible teaches us, comes from the Spirit of God. And... We've learned from the first law of thermodynamics that energy, true, the energy that is in the world cannot be destroyed or diminished in any way. It can change forms and shapes because energy is from God. And God is forever. He is, he's always, always has been and He always will be. He breathed a part of that, a part of Himself, into a lump of clay and we became a living soul. When that body dies, that part of God that God breathed into us, who became that became us, the Bible teaches us that it continues to live on, and that it maintains and retains our personality, our memories, our thought, who we are, our personality. And as a matter of fact, that you and I, our body is not us. Your body is not you. It's just what houses you, is what carries you about. The Bible often calls it our tent. Or our tabernacle. It's just kind of like where we live. There is a unique hope offered in Christ. That's what Paul says here to the Corinthians. Let's look here in 1 Corinthians. Let's look at this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. It says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, and he says, That's really, I told you that that's the gospel that we preach, that Christ raised from the dead. How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
some of the Corinthian church members. Now, the question is asking, you know, uh, can you really be a Christian if you don't believe this or believe that? I do believe that our relationship to God is based upon faith. But remember that it's, we're saved not by faith, but we're saved by grace. Now, God uses faith. It's saved by grace through faith, Paul says. But uh, there have been many things in my theological life, in my Christian walk, in my Christian journey, that my beliefs were not correct. I've corrected many of them. God's corrected me. I, I've grown. I've matured. I know more, and there's a great deal more that I need to know. There are things that I probably, probably believe in now and preach that God is trying to change me. This is just the fact of any hum, human being, I think. But there was an error in the Corinthian church, and Paul doesn't question their salvation. He doesn't question whether or not they are saved or not. He just says, some of you don't believe in the resurrection. Of, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. I'm sure that some of them said, well, I won't rise again, and you won't rise. Now, Jesus was special. Yes, Jesus was special, but he became a human being so that when he came here, that what happened to him and what he did, that who Jesus was and what his life was like matters to your life and mine. If he was so special, then we'd say, well, you know, that's just uh, Jesus. Uh, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with me and you. But everything Jesus did and said and everything he was or became, he would say, this is about you. Why in the world would I come in here and take upon human flesh? If, if the dead are not, don't rise, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Let's go on, Andy. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that He raised Christ from the dead. He says, you know, I don't... Uh, I, I, did I tell you something that was not true? He says, but, the, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. Sounds like he's going around and around, but he's really wanting to make a point here. You think, or I might even tell you, that you've got a problem if you don't believe that one day when you die, that there's going to be a life, a continuance of your life and your existence after your body dies. He says that's one thing. But he says the main thing is, is, that's not the most important part. The whole point of Jesus' message was the message that he enacted, that he portrayed with his life and his death. He says it's important to believe that Jesus was seen, that he came back to life, that he died and he came back to life. Let's go on. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. You see, being a Christian doesn't make you sinless. Being religious doesn't make you. It's the fact that Jesus died for you. And He is your atonement. Then those of you who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. He's talking about people who have died. People who have died, they're, they're just gone. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are all people most to be pitied. I like, uh, this is I think the NIV, the New International Version, the King James Version said, if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. We have hope. Resurrection hope. I think there's one more slide, Andy, and that's it. I want to do something, uh, a little role playing this morning. And I really can't finish this uh, sermon unless you participate a little bit. And it's not outward open, it's kind of a mental application. And I need you to do this because it, uh, I want to make a point about our circumstances as God's people in the world right now and our hope. The death and resurrection of Jesus 
was at once the most terrible and wonderful thing that ever happened to the people who loved him and knew him because they were not they didn't just love him and and know him they they were depending upon him and they, all of their hope was in him everything that they hoped about the future and about eternity and about life in general they had decided i'm going to invest all of this into jesus and they did and when he died everything collapsed i mean they left their fishing businesses and their tax collecting businesses and they they left their homes and their families and they left their, their own lives and circumstances and they put everything in him and then he died. He didn't just die. It was a tragic, awful, messy death. Yes, he rose again on the third day. But the resurrection did not undo the cross. It didn't make it all better. It didn't undo all their heartache and the pain and their loss and their tragedy and the weeping. And the, the... Yes, Jesus was alive, and I'm sure that they were awash with all, every kind of emotion. But what the, what the cross had done in their lives was not removed just simply because Jesus was now alive. But Paul was saying that the cross of Christ has no value or no meaning and no power unless Jesus is alive. Even people that do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God or that He was divine or that He was a Savior or that He was uh, anything that He said He was, people would say, well, yes, there was a Jesus and He was a great man, He was a wise scholar and, and, and a great rabbi. And yes, uh, they, he died. They, they nailed him to the cross. But, you know, he just was just a human being. Anybody could kind of do that. You could be a great teacher, a great human being, and someone could kill you. The resurrection, though, is what made it different. It's what was different about him from all the other messiahs who come before him or who would ever come after him. Now let's do this. Here's what I want you to do. This is your part. I want you to cast your mind back to that time. I want you to cast your mind and your imagination. I want you to use your spiritual imagination this morning. And I want you to think of yourself as one of the apostles. Pick one. Just kind of who you want to be this morning. You're going to assume an identity this morning. Or one of the disciples. You might be one of the men or one of the women who followed Jesus. You might be Mary or Martha or Mary the mother of Jesus. Martha, the, the sister of Lazarus, you might be Lazarus. You, you might be James or John. You might be Matthew. But, but think of yourself as one of Jesus' followers. You're a Christian and you are a disciple. It should be very easy for you to say, okay, let's, let's assume that I'm Matthew, the tax collector. All right, let's think about this. You're in the marketplace and it's a tumult. It's a, it's a chaos. I've been in a Middle Eastern marketplace and it's just nuts. It's elbow to elbow and just sweat and talking and laughter and languages and human flesh just everywhere. All up and down. No, 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 not a wedge to, to move. And there was Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. Are you Matthew? Now, Jesus is in town, and he's made his presence known. When John baptized him, Jesus was announced as the Lamb of God, and Jesus begins his public ministry. And so Jesus is beginning to become popular and to become known. So people, everybody, especially in the marketplace, know that something's going on. When Jesus kind of popped out of the crowd, and he stood there for a moment in front of Matthew. Now, Matthew wasn't there by himself. There was a whole table full of tax collectors. And they were keeping ledgers and writing down things. And they had bags of money and they had little scales. And Jesus kind of stood there. He came and stood in front of Matthew, just one of them. He didn't give, he didn't sing just as I am, give an invitation to everybody. He stood right there. And Matthew looked up. I think he looked up and I think he knew who that was right there. He'd heard about it. He might have even seen it. He might have even been following 
what everybody was saying about him, or maybe he'd heard Jesus speak before. And there he was, and he stood right there. He stood right in front of him. Matthew put his pen down, his quill, or whatever he was writing with, scratching with, and he looked up. And Jesus said, Follow me. Follow me. Now that, that's amazing. You know what's more amazing? He followed him. He did. Jesus turned on his heel. And Matthew didn't say he gathered up his stuff. <laughs> he didn't say he, he put all his stuff in a bag and he, he put off, or he said, here, I'll be right back. I'm going to clock out, but I'll be back in after lunch. It says he got up and he followed Jesus. He left his stuff behind. He did. And he followed Jesus for the rest of his life. Follow me. For the next three and a half years, he made every step that Jesus made. He walked with him. He walked beside him and they talked. You know what? That, that very same week, you know what Matthew did? He had a party. That's what tax collectors do, man. They have parties. Invited Jesus to the party. He wanted to say thank you. That's the only way he knew how to have a party. Uh, say thank you to have a party. So he did and he would go with Jesus to other parties and other feasts, other celebrations. But for three and a half years, he made every step. And he sat around the fire with Jesus. And uh, the next day, Matthew, just kind of walking along, didn't report for work that day. <laughs> and they walked down by the Sea of Galilee, and there's a fishing company, the Zebedees, down there, and they're cleaning their nets. They're kind of put, they're finishing up. And Jesus does the same thing. He walks over to the seashore. Maybe I, I've, I've dangled my feet in that water. The most amazing thing you could ever do. <laughs> Somebody says, are, are you going down to the beach? You're going to get in the Gulf of Mexico? I said, I've had my feet in the Sea of Galilee. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> yeah, a picture of Terry. Terry has funny toes. Show me your toes, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Terry has funny toes. I found that out before I married her. I married her anyway. Even if she has funny toes. Now everybody wants to see your toes at the church. So show them. It's, a, it's worth seeing. It's worth seeing. Show me your toes. Never seen any toes like that. <coughs> in the Sea of Galilee. He walked down there and he looked right at James and John. And he said, follow me. And I'll make you to become fishers of men. They didn't say a word. Their dad said, hey! Everywhere. They somehow or another went and got some bed rolls or grabbed a few scraps of bread or something. I don't know. They went back. They, they followed him. I mean, they were stiff. Three and a half years, night and day, 24 hours a day, they heard every word that he said. And they spent time with him. That, I mean, they were never separated from him. They kept people off of him. And they brought people to him. And he did that. He just kind of went. People began to follow. People began to hear him. And he would sit on a mountainside. There is a, a basilica there called the, on the Mount of Beatitudes. Supposedly that's where Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount. And you can go there and you can just kind of say, hello, and it, you know, people, someone 100 yards away can hear what you're saying and understand it. And Jesus sat there on the hillside and they listened to Jesus teach. And he said, blessed are the Poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he gave the Sermon on the Mount. And they traveled together. And, and, and the disciple band grew to twelve apostles. And it says they scrounged around, and sometimes he'd send them off to get supplies. And they'd go into town, and they'd bring the groceries back. And 
they, they had to gather firewood and they'd build a fire. And, and, and after he called Simon Peter, they went over to Simon Peter and said, come over to my house. And they got over there and Simon Peter's mother-in-law was sick and Jesus healed her from a very severe fever. She'd lost her sense of taste. And they formed a ring around him. And there was a time when, when that didn't work. And they were just crowding. And Jesus just kept backing up. And there were more and more people. There were hundreds and thousands of people. They'd come. Listen, this is just a village. This is just a little town. It's just a little nothing. No, just a nothing. And there, and there were, where did all these people come from? And they just kept backing up. And one of the disciples said, hey. Let's get in one of Daddy's boats here. They put Jesus in a boat. They cast off. And I believe that people still waited out until the water was up underneath their armpits trying to get closer. And then Jesus sat there in that boat. And for hours, he just taught them. And the only way they, they could keep the crowds off of him was to put him in that boat and cast off a little bit from the shore. Yes, they saw him walk on water. And the very first thing they saw him do was turn the water into wine. It was the best wine they'd ever had. They didn't even usually get invited to weddings. But they went to a wedding with Jesus. And uh, they went to a party at Matthew's. And they went over to Simon Peter's house. The ruins of Simon Peter's house are still there in Capernaum. They kind of built up like a spaceship. It's a round glass building over the ruins of what they believe is Simon Peter's house. There's a synagogue right next, the ruins of a synagogue right next door to it, where Jesus was teaching in the synagogue. It's just amazing. One time they kind of had a ring around Jesus, and somebody had had a good idea to gather up all the children. It was probably one of the older children, said, let's go see Jesus, and then they, they came. I don't know how many of them there were, but the disciples said, hey, 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 you can't be bugging Jesus. You can't be, Jesus can't be bothered with you little kids. And Jesus said, what? He said, let them kids come in here. And he took them all up on his lap, and he said, he blessed them. He said, you better, better. What's wrong with y'all? He said, y'all going to have to be just like these little children if you're ever going to get into heaven. They suddenly became an object lesson. I believe that Lazarus and Martha and Mary had known Jesus all of his life. I believe that, that when the Joseph and Marys ever came into Jerusalem for holy days, I believe they stayed in Bethany. And they, that's how they met Lazarus and his family over in Bethany. And every time Jesus came to Jerusalem, they all, always went and stayed in Bethany. He didn't want to stay in Jerusalem. Living in town, I don't know. He grew up in, in Nazareth. A little town. A little country town. It's dark. And it might be on the Mount of Olives and you're all sitting around a campfire. And every eye and every ear is always on Jesus because anytime he says something, you want to hear what he has to say and you want to watch what he's doing. And you're with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you have been for a long time. And you're following Jesus. And you're one of his apostles. You're one of his disciples. You love Jesus. That's who you are. And that's, what you're, that's the only thing that matters in your life. Being together, they talk to each other. They ask each other questions. They argue about who's going to be the greatest. <laughs> Fools is like that. And they ask each other, what do you think he meant? What do you think we're going to do? What did you find? Got a little boy here who's got a lunch. That ain't much. That ain't enough. What are we going to do? And this ragtag bunch of men and women had never even known each other before, became a family. You know what Jesus called them? He called them my church. My church. My church. No 
Now let me tell you something. That was sweet. That was sweet. And they, they sang together. And they had music together. And they worshipped together. They went into the temple together. They ate meals together. They broke bread together. And they became close, close, close. Tight. And they loved each other. They'd never even known each other before. And then in John's Gospel, chapter 16, Jesus started telling these people, enjoy this, because there's going to come a time when all of this is going to go away. It's going to change. And you're never going to be able to do this in this lifetime ever again. I'm going away. That scared them to death. I'm going away for a little while. They said, where are you going? Why are you going? What if every day you could see Jesus? In John's Gospel, or the Epistle, John chapter 1, he says, we, we saw Him, we heard Him, we handled Him, we touched Him, we embraced Him, we, we, we put our arms around Him. We, we, when He needed a, a, a leg up, we gave Him a foot, a, a hoist. Uh, we get, reached out our hand to help Him get up out of the boat. We came in one day to the shore and he had miraculously caught some fish and he had some bread and fish on the fire and he fed us and we ate together. But what God is doing next, Jesus said, all of this will be gone. No matter how much you love it or enjoy it or how much you depend upon it, the way we're living together now and enjoying one another's fellowship and where we are, we're each other's company and we're each other's family and we encourage one another we help one another God is going to scatter us to the winds what if you lost that where you had been spending every minute of your life with Jesus I mean not just in church not just in worship not just in religious activity, but I mean with Jesus. And then suddenly He was not there. He was gone. And all the other disciples were gone too. You weren't getting together. You weren't having church. And you begin to think, you know, well, something dawned on you. Bing, kind of like that. Jesus said, wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, there am I in your midst. And I kind of wanted to say two or three. I said, Lord, there are thousands of people. Look, we're having to keep them off you with a stick. We're having to put you in a boat. We're having to go to the other side of the, of the Sea of Galilee just to get away from them. Two or three. Jesus was saying there's going to come a time when if two or three of you can get together, that's all you're going to have. And you need to know that if there's only two or three of you and you're having to wear gloves and masks, that I am there with you. You need to know that. What if you lost that? There are wonderful experiences that you've had in church, maybe even in this church. Revivals that you've been to. It's times, the time that you got saved when Jesus walked up to your table and said, follow me, and you did Seeing other people saved, seeing your children saved, seeing people baptized, being baptized, those kinds of experiences. The first disciples had all of those things and a thousand times more because Jesus himself was with them every day and all of it went away when he died, when he rose again, when he went back to heaven. All of it was no more. And they would never have that again. It would never be like that where Jesus was sitting by the fire and they were looking through the flames at Him and asking Him questions. And our whole family of faith was there and they could hug each other and fellowship and support and encourage each other. They would never, ever, ever have that again. And it's not a loss. And it's not a tragedy. And it's not something you know, they could have said, 
We've lost everything because we don't have it the way it used to be. They have a fire in their heart because they knew that God was doing something. And at first, the Roman Empire would persecute them. Until one day, the Roman Emperor bowed his knee to the cross. And the Emperor became a Christian. Constantine gave his life to Christ. The Roman Emperor. The Emperor of the Roman Empire. Doubting Thomas died all by himself over in Madras, India. I've stood at his tomb. Peter was imprisoned. First of all, we know that James, Stephen was stoned to death and it scattered the church everywhere. James, the brother of John, was arrested and Herod had him beheaded because he thought it would make him a little more popular. Peter was taken to Rome and he was crucified on a cross that hung him upside down. Andrew was crucified on a cross in the shape and the form of it, the letter X. That today is still the symbol or the emblem for the Apostle Andrew. And they could say, remember the time when we all just, when Jesus was with us and he was in the boat and we could see him and we could hear him and we could touch him and hold him. We talked with him and he talked to us and we could hear him. Remember that? At any given time they could say, it's not like it used to be and they could have quit. They could have been discouraged. They could have lost heart. But friends, I know that you may have these same feelings. There are wonderful experiences that you've had in your faith in church that have to do with fellowship and sharing with each other and shaking hands and hugging and holding and kissing one another and loving on one another. We may or we may not ever see that return. If we do, fine. But what if God is doing something like He did back then so that He could bring millions to the cross? What if God is doing something that is more important than you and I being able to have chicken, fried chicken together and crank some ice cream or have a barbecue? What if God is doing something that is so important that it involves changing our entire lives? I cannot imagine what it would be like to spend three years living with Jesus night and day and then just suddenly saying, well, if I'm going to get in touch with Him, I'm just going to have to pray. That doesn't seem very satisfying. I wish it was, it was the way it used to be. And I might even be inclined to try to do everything in my power to try to get it back to the way it used to be. And God says, that's not what I'm doing. I'm not trying, I'm not, God's not ever trying to get things back to, to be what they used to be. He's moving forward. He wants to do something that has never been done. God is doing something that has never been done. And we can sit around and say, woe is me. It's not like it used to be. It's not like I remember when I was a new Christian. It's not like it was when I was a young person or a young believer. It's not like it was when, I, when my children were small. It's not like it was when we used to have revivals or lay witness renewals on the weekend. It's not like it used to be. Well, friends, it's never going to be. But let's tune up and say, God, what are you doing? And it probably doesn't have anything at all to do with recapturing our memories. Jesus said, I don't want you to go back to Nazareth or back to Capernaum. I don't want you to go back to the seas, the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He says, let's do something that's never been done. Don't mourn. You. you might be in mourning. You might be grieving. You might be so sad and so distraught and so upset that things have so drastically changed. Your life and my faith life has not changed nearly as much as it did for those early apostles. Look at how much they lost. And look at what they gave up. And look what they no longer had. And all they could think is, well, 
The best we can hope for is maybe we'll get two or three together because when two or three together, He's promised to be in our midst. What do we need to do then? Well, let's go out and make two or three. We may not be able to get two or three to come here, but Jesus said, you're going to have to gather them together. And it may not mean coming to church or having church like you remember church or even having church like you wish church was. God is doing something that has never been done before. Not, not about the plague. There have been plagues before. Or viruses. There have been viruses. There have been diseases. The church has been scattered before, but God is doing something. Friends, take off your sackcloth and your ash. Quit mourning and grieving over what used to be that is no longer. And begin to seek the will of God. God, what do you want me to do right now? What are you doing in my life? What do you want me to do in this plan of yours? And not to be so disappointed and so discouraged and so downhearted as if God or His people have somehow or another completely messed everything up. They haven't. Everything is perfectly on track. It's just exactly where it needs to be. God is doing just exactly what He wants to do. And we need to decide if we're going to continue to grieve over the way things used to be. Or say, God... Make me a part of what you're doing right now. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace to us. You are a God of hope and life and resurrection. Lord, your death and your resurrection changed everything. It changed everything. And you didn't die on the cross and raise from the dead so that we could continue to sit with you around the campfire and eat fish and french fries together sit in a boat or soak our feet in the Sea of Galilee or follow you along the dusty trails of Capernaum or listen to you talk while sitting on the mountainside. There's a whole world out there, perhaps even a whole universe, and you are the Lord of it all. You ask me to follow you, Lord. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. And I know, Lord, that you're not moving backward. You're moving forward. I want to follow you. I will. And I pray it in your name. Amen. Danny, come and lead us in a hymn of dedication and decision. Hymn number 553.
I, I received a, just a wonderful delight this week. I don't know if you saw it or not, but uh, Ronnie found an old clip from uh, Coopers and Sons this week of a hog call. Now, friends, there's not anything that will bless you like a hog call. <laughs> <laughs> but I preached on that from 1 Corinthians 14 a couple of weeks ago when Paul said that he'd rather that you did <laughs> do hog call it in church. <laughs> but as it happens out 25 years ago, wasn't it? Neil Reeves was calling hogs there on Cooper's and something. Did you get to see that? If you didn't, uh, it's on Ronnie's Facebook page, Ronnie and Karen's Facebook page, and I, I think I put it on the church's Facebook page and get to see. I never met Brother Neil. But uh, I, I believe right now if you can come to contact Brother Neil, I, I, I've, I've listened to him sing. He loved to sing. And I've heard all of the good works that he ever did while he and Miss Reeves lived here on this plane for this church and for their Lord. And I believe if you could contact him right now and say, Brother Neil, come back and bring us old church, he would say, I think I'm going to stay where I am at. <laughs> Why don't you come where I am at? And we'll really have church. Thank you so much. I enjoyed that. What a blessing. I have some old movies of my day. And uh, my mama too. But I, I tell you, that's a he was a pretty good hog caller. Now, I didn't see hogs show up, but, but he, he actually, they were just having a good time. Having a good time. I don't know how he found that, but that was a, a blessing. Don't forget, especially the old saints of the past. And yes, what a wonderful, sweet pleasure and joy it was to worship with them. And how we, yeah, I do wish it could be. Uh, there, are, there are times when I, I think often, I just wish it could be like that again. And the Lord says, I'm glad you remember that with fondness. Now get up and let's go. Let's get on around. All right. God bless you all. Is there anything I've overlooked today or forgotten? If, if you're going to give a birthday whipping to uh, Victoria, you better catch her before she gets out the door. <laughs> and, uh, otherwise, God bless you all. Be careful going home. Keep each other in your prayers, all right? God bless you all. You're dismissed. Don't tell anybody about this Bible. <laughs> <laughs> a little too late. Said the lambs were watching. Okay. The lambs were watching. Well, good. I thought they might be. Well, you're on the spot now. Be careful. Everybody. They'll tell everybody. Oh, yeah. Thank you, man. Appreciate y'all. Oh, yeah.